And one of the programs that we highlighted was the transportation safety education program for Clackamas County. And what we have here today are the people who represent the Clackamas County program, Joe and Rob. And Joe, to differentiate them, uh, Joe is the program manager and has been with Clackamas County for almost 30 years. Manager of this program, I think, for decades. <laughs> I spoke with Walt uh, McAllister about him, and Walt told me that he'd been working with Joe personally for at least 15 years, and he wasn't sure exactly how long, but he could vouch for 15 years. Uh, Rob is newer. Uh, Rob is a hands-on public education person, and I think they have a terrific story to tell. And if these if these aren't the most two knowledge the two most knowledgeable people in Oregon about transportation safety, public education, I'd be surprised. But I think you're going to be impressed with the program. Uh, uh, Joe is going to talk a little bit about the evolution of the program. When you have a program that's been around for that long, he's going to be able to show us how they put the foundation of the program in place, how it's evolved. And then Rob is going to talk some about what they're doing right now, what, what their campaigns look like, how they shape campaigns, what the principles are that they uh, are behind the campaign. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to Joe. And I just want to chime in that Walt just joined as well. So welcome, Walt. OK, thank you. And uh, for advancing the slides, um, I'll just say advance. Does that work? Works for me. OK, Rob, are you running the slides? I'm running the slides. Oh, awesome. OK, <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for um, having us here today. And again, we wish we could be have traveled over to Ben, but oh well. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So. Uh, what I want to cover today is a little bit of um, our journey of getting to where we've gotten. And um, and the reason I think that's important because I think about this work as putting bricks in a foundation. And so there's a lot of bricks that we've put in the foundation over the years to create uh, our little building that we have now around transportation, safety, and health. So next slide. Can you hear it? No. Oh, dang. Can you hear it now? Yes. Uh, yeah, can yes. you turn it up? Yeah. It went away. Rob, okay. when you share, there's a button that says share computer audio next to it. If you might click resharing, I think it might have the audio go through cleaner. I thought I tried this. Okay, when I share this button, it doesn't. It didn't give me that choice. When when I tested it out, it did. <laughs> we love technology. At the on my, it might be different on yours if it's a different if it's not the web version. But there's a little um slider button kind of at the top it's not actually have to go checkbox but it says include computer sound right next yeah, to the I had it when i tested it out uh so we can 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 we did it i came on early so i can test it that was your mistake We're very proactive right yeah i you know what i wonder if it has to do with the recording Oh, OK, I see it. I'm having a little problem with my. It's way down on my screen. Got it. No, it goes right into it. Oh. Sorry. There we go. I got it now. I would say zero. <laughs> We got time built into our uh, presentation for stuff like this. Now, can you hear it? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Rob. I would guess, I'm going to say 12. More than 20? 25. 10, 5 to 10, 5. Maybe 10. 
I mean, there isn't really a number that's acceptable. Two? Nothing's acceptable, but we take a risk when we get in our vehicles. Uh, fatalities? Zero. I would say zero. <laughs> zero. 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 None is acceptable. Life is precious. That's a video we did. Oh, got three, two, no, three or four years ago at the county fair that we did that, and um, you know, pretty powerful video in terms of really what what people desire, and that is they want to get home safely to their families every night, and so that's really the, you know, one of the the, the roots of our work here is is around that. Um, as we go through time, you know, I've been with the county for a long time. I took over our traffic safety commission in the mid 1990s, and um, you know, those monthly meetings with with our citizens always kept safety at the forefront for me. And we were constantly talking about how we have crashes, and you know, we have engineering solutions, things that we can do. We didn't always have money, but also we always talked about the people component, is like how do we change behavior, and so that is you know, was all, has always been in the back of my mind. And in 2005, with a grant through ODOT, we formed our Safe Communities Program. And in that program, we first started uh, delving into the world of public health, as well as outreach. We started doing presentations in high schools. We started working with our Office of Children, Youth, and Families, um, doing doing education around binge drinking, and actually started our, our poster contest that we still do to this day back back at that time. So we started building these bridges with particularly public health um, way back in 2005. And, and so, you know, another brick in the foundation. And um, let's see, I think, let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, Rob, can you advance? Rob? Next slide. What's you're not seeing an advance? We're, we're seeing an advance here. Oh, well, that's oh, there we go. Um, do you mean to go backwards? Go now? back one, yeah. And, um, and so you know, after that, the uh, safe communities program, um. It was somewhere around that time, probably 2008 or 2009, I was at a traffic safety conference. I remember there was a physician speaking and he was talking about how um, traffic crashes were a public health issue. And I remember that really resonating with me because I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, people, people are people are killed, people are hurt, you know, especially long term injuries. And a good example is my own father who was in a car crash when I was very young and he suffered a traumatic brain injury that affected him for the rest of his life, causing a lot of behavioral issues and a premature death. And so in 2010, when the World Health, World Health Organization declared uh, traffic crashes as a public health issue, you know, this was a really important step that really said, hey, you know, we, we need to do more um, as we can to, to reduce road fatalities. Uh, next slide. And so um, we started working on a transportation safety action plan in um, about 2010 through some uh, funding from, from ODOT Transportation Safety Division and, and adopted that plan in 2012 with a goal at that time to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes by 50% by 2020. And what was important about that plan is, um, you know, that we took that first step to look at a plan. It was more of a policy level. We also um, tried to incorporate public health into that plan, at least by way of mentioning it, because we, we, we still, we had done some stuff with public health, but there was a lot more to be done, but we included that as, a, as an element because we knew it was very important. So, you know, it's another brick in our foundation. Um, and I know we were, I think the first county in Oregon to, do, to uh, complete a safety action plan that was adopted by our board. and. 
I believe we were actually one of the very early counties in the country to do that. A lot of counties were doing them, but the DOTs were really doing them for them. And so this was one where we we made a choice to say, hey, safety is important. We need to plot a, a better path forward for us. And we want the endorsement of our elected officials. The next slide. 2014, um, we had towards zero deaths, which was the work of Ashto that that started, and so we we were involved in that, and we're still a, a you know a partner around towards zero deaths, and so that was another another piece of this puzzle, and really this beginning of national recognition around um, getting to getting to zero, and then as we we move on in time. Another really important piece is some work that ODOT had done, which was taking the safety money that they had actually been been holding within their agency to do safety work and putting it out to the local agencies due to some federal legislation. And they developed this jurisdictionally blind all roads transportation safety program. And you know, in my opinion, I think this has been a really good program because it's allowed monies to be spread in a systemic way across the network. And I remember looking back to a really good safety project that we built many years ago. It was like a $2 million safety project at an intersection. And, and as much good as that project did, I just remember thinking, it's like, golly, you know, we're meeting all these federal requirements. It's really driven up the price of this project. And for $2 million, I could do tons of signing around my 1400 mile network. So I was really excited when ODOT made this adjustment to looking at roadways in a more systemic way and applying low cost countermeasures to really more effectively put, put improvements out there that were gonna really um, have a bigger impact on reducing fatals. Next slide. So the, the county also began to develop a set of strategic priorities as a countywide initiative. And um, because we had the Transportation Safety Action Plan in place and actually were doing some work with public health, essentially um, some of the policies that were developed were influenced by the fact that we had the Safety Action Plan. And I'm, I'm very proud of that and really pleased because of that collaboration across our organization, that that recognition of public health and that recognition of transportation safety and the huge importance was recognized as the county developed those strategic priorities. And actually what happened out of that for our section was the county did some restructuring, actually formed uh, a traffic safety section. You know, before we were just a traffic engineering division, and we did a whole variety of, of things, including safety. But because of that restructuring, there was a need um, to actually develop a department that was really specific towards safety. And also along with that was beginning to set up the ability for us to have a regular funding, funding stream. And so we, for safety projects, you know, I was scrapping for money between all the road maintenance projects and other projects trying to get safety projects done. And so being able to dedicate funds to safety was was really important. And again, I think a recognition about the importance of safety by the elected officials of the county. In 2016, ODOT um, updated their safety action plan with a goal to eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035. And then we also, um, have safety elements included in our community health improvement plan. And again, that was due to this long, longer term relationship that we set up with public health dating back to like 2006 when we started doing outreach um, around binge drinking. And, and so we slowly built up this relationship with public health to where as they developed that community health improvement plan, we were invited to the table to, to share our perspectives on, on traffic safety and public health, um, you know, had a recognition that transportation was a key element around public health, just as we, we saw public health as a key element to transportation. And so we began kind of this cross pollination between our two departments to work together and understand each other's language 
and also begin to intertwine policies around both public health and transportation between and within our respective departments. And the important reason for, for doing that is because as we look at programs such as safety or incorporation of public health and safety, we want those institutionalized. We don't want those to go away easily. And that has been one of my missions after having uh, one program actually removed and having to fight very hard to bring it back is the lesson learned for me was I needed to work harder to, to get these programs institutionalized by way of policies within the organizations and also by collaboration across departments. So we updated our safety action plan in, in 2018 and then following ODOT's goals of, of elimination of fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035. And, th and this plan was a much broader inclusion of, of public health as well as the plan included a policy element and projects. And then also within this plan, we started to begin to think about this whole safe systems approach to safety. And that is this notion of uh, safe systems, probably most of you know, was started in Sweden in the 90s. And it was the recognition that we as humans are prone to make errors. And as we make errors using the transportation system, we don't want those errors to result in death or serious injury. And as we look at our safety action plan following the towards zero deaths model, um, and that ODOT has also follow, followed is looking at these different categories around crash data trends, safe drivers and passengers, safe infrastructure, safe vehicles, safe vulnerable users, enhanced emergency medical services, safety culture, and safety management. And so as, as we look at, obviously all of you know, part of this is looking at our own data, so that those data components and um, as we look at our own crashes, looking at a three-year average for fatalities. And Rob, are you have you advanced the slide? I'm yep. not seeing an advanced slide on my end. We're on the three-year uh, average. Oh, chart. there must be a lag on my computer because that's not what I'm seeing. <laughs> that's what. Oh, there we go. Um, so our three-year average, we were on a beautiful trajectory. It was probably the result of the uh, uh, recession. And then, as you can see, we've kind of jumped back up and we're hovering in the mid 30s for fatals. And I guess if there's any silver lining in this graph is looking at our population, which has gone from about 366,000 to 420,000. So if you were to do our fatals per capita, perhaps we're doing a little bit better, but it, it shows how much work needs to be done and how traffic safety really has to be holistic. I can't fix the world from an engineering side of the house if I have users of the roadway that are, um, you know, behaving in ways that result in crashes or result in injuring others. And so that's a important piece as we look into our data and which you've done in your plans is looking at our, you know, our fatals and our serious injury data and looking at not so much the locational data, but really more thinking about what are those key key cause factors. And for our county, we have our inexperienced drivers as one of our top, as along with roadway departure type crashes and aggressive driving. Those top three tend to move around with each other as you look over time, but still have been been the top three for a long time. And then as moving around the 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 other ones that that come up are motorcycle crashes heavily heavily overrepresented and then alcohol and drug are older drivers and then bicycles and pedestrians and those also move around too and so when you look at those those top categories those provide a lot of guidance in terms of the type of work that we should be doing as well as the educational type outreach in terms of looking at culture change and this next uh, graphic represents this, this safe systems concept in terms of looking at our safe road users and vehicles and speeds and roadways in terms of when those systems fails versus having redundancy and layers of protection so we keep people safe. And that's, and that's something on the safe systems. We're, we're all starting to learn that and trying to understand what does that mean for our own agency 
And um, I think we have a lot to learn, but there's certainly a lot we can do with this across the organization. So if I look at kind of these building blocks that, that I think are important to, to keep in mind, you know, as, as you move forward, and even as we, we continue to move forward on this journey of getting to zero is, um, you know, understanding our crash data trends and our modes, and really this recognition and inclusion of public health and the role of safety, as well as having public health include transportation and the work that they're doing. And so the integration of that work. And then obviously, you know, staff management and elected officials recognition of the importance of safety and the desire to pri prioritize eliminating fatal and serious injury crashes. I mean, we can have people to give it lip service, but you know, at some point we really need to make investments. And that's something the county actually did do with our safety program because I actually have an operating budget now where I never did before. And that came about as some decisions about how to spend the uh, House Bill 2017 money and then a local um, vehicle registration fee that the county passed resulted in a safety budget for me going from sort of whatever I could scrap to now it's close to $2 million a year. And then plus we get some general fund allocation that supports Rob's really important work of doing the, the softer people side of this. And then all of you know, you know, we want community support for safety and public health goals, which I think, you know, the community is, is on board with that. And then the really important part within the organization, so the program sustains over time, is really intertwining that safety, public health, transportation policies across the organizational structure to ensure longevity. And in my mind, I think that's what I would call culture change within the organization to support that type of work. So less siloing, more inclusion and collaborating. And then, as I already mentioned, that funding to do the work, both the infrastructure, that non-infrastructure work and those, those public health elements. And with that, I think we can um, answer questions before Rob takes us into the softer side of safe systems. Parker on mute. Joe? Yes. And, uh, let me ask a, a couple here. One, I'm um, interested in the dedicated funding sources. If you tell the story just a little bit more about those, uh, you mentioned the vehicle registration fee, local vehicle registration fee, and I know you have a couple more. So can you talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, the, the funding sources. So when the uh, House bill 2017 was passed, um, the county looked at that incoming funding. And so we, we had about a 20, $21 million road fund budget. And I, I think the House Bill 2017 money was bringing in another 13 million. And I think because of the work we had done on the safety side as management and the elected officials discussed how to, to spend that money, there was a decision made to allocate some of it directly to safety. And so as they looked at financial projections, uh, that money started at 500,000 a year and goes up to, I think 1.5 when we fully get all that house bill 2017 funding. Um, we are already building safety projects with that. And, and again, that came about because of the safety action plan and the adoption of the plan and that recognition that safety is important and we do need to fund it. Um, secondarily, when the county looked at doing the vehicle registration fee, they took that money, which I believe it's about five million a year, and they decided to do essentially uh, paving for half of it, so local road paving, or maybe it was a third of it, and then some capacity improvement projects that also have safety elements and then direct safety improvement. So again, because of the work we'd done on the safety action plan, a decision was made to say, hey, we need to put more money into safety. So we're gonna put additional funding into the safety line for doing safety related projects. And we've been using that, that money as well to, to build safety projects. And the, the projects are wide and diverse from 
you know, basic signing stuff that, pro that you all have done, you know, curve signing to um, signal timing and signal modifications to make signals safer, things like adding reflectorized backboards and, and really simple things to more complicated safety projects. And then the last part um, is the funding for Rob, which is from our general fund. And so uh, the other stuff was all essentially road fund, which has some restrictions of how we spend it. We have to spend it on roads. And so the education piece actually came about, has had a very long and winding road, which goes back to the Safe Communities Program, which was initially started between the, our Department of Transportation and Development and the Sheriff's Office. And part of the initial goals for the sheriff's office was to reinstate the justice court and to pull and to use some revenues from the justice court to fund safety. And so ultimately the justice court did get up and running. Um, there was some money that transferred, but there were a bunch of things that happened within the sheriff's office and the, the program ultimately got shifted over to DTD. Um, along with the person who had been a sheriff's office employee that I was supervising. And then the Board of County Commissioners made a decision to also fund fund the program out of general fund. And so that has that has uh, been maintained for a number of years. So that pays for Rob's position and provides some funding for us to do projects. And, and through that effort and, and Rob's really hard work, we've been able to get some grants and we get support from ODOT. But we also have a grant from the uh, National Safety Foundation through the Road to Zero program to do some outreach that Rob will be talking about. So hopefully that's uh, enough detail. That's great. Other other questions that people have for Joe? I think it's a, a lot of work and just, um, I know later we're gonna talk about how you started and how, how we can create opportunities, um, but just, as you send this off, our transportation mobility department that Robin mentioned, Janet Ruby's on as well, um, is really just just beginning to grow. So listening to this story and thinking of the context of how this department can grow to have a safety position might help. Um, might you know just give it some context. There's a, a lot of moving parts and nothing's firmed yet. And it looks like Janet's got her hand up. So go ahead, Janet. Well, how about some volume? Hi, Joe and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. You see my antics. Um, my question is, as you, when you got started, did your TSAP plan that kind of helped pave the way um, when you were getting the different funding elements. Did it have specific projects and costs like very detailed or was it a bigger rolled up plan like ours? We have a good one, but it's got some general mitigations. It doesn't necessarily it has a few specific projects, um, but it's not a full implementation plan. So can you talk about what level you had when you got all that funding? Yeah, when we when we developed the um, first safety action plan, it was a, a little bit higher level plan. It was really more policy. It was policy and a little bit bigger picture. We actually didn't have the funding to take stuff down to the project level. We did some some general stuff, um, but but we we but we we had some some projects, some safety projects that we that we were doing, but we didn't. We weren't able to like provide a formal, more formalized list like we did in our updated plan. But also when we did our transportation system plan update, what we ended up doing in that document, because we weren't able to do what the TSAP is, our, our planners kind of carved out a little safety part of the transportation system plan. And we we're able to take those projects that we kind of had on our list and put them in there. And so we ultimately ended up with a placeholder for a lot of the work. And at the time it was some safety projects, but it was a lot of road safety audits and more general stuff. And so that that kind of got us that one little step ahead and you know, kind of got our little foot in the door, so so to speak, with with that. And and so much of this is, you know, as I look back on the work, it's 
it's been, you know, seizing on opportunities and it's like, oh, shoot, I can't do this, but oh, I can do this instead. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, it's learning as we go. And and um, the, the other thing I, I do want to express is really excitement for all of you as you start this. Because when we started doing this in the county, I mean, there weren't tons of champions. You know, I, I was pushing this and 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 it was a lot of kind of marketing and, and diplomatic persistence to get it going. And so with all of you, with all your connections and your enthusiasm, you know, I see the ability to really for all of you to take the plan get all the right champions in there and really do some wonderful things and do it quicker than it's taken me. <laughs> and I'll talk a bit more about the collaboration side. Hopefully challenge accepted, Joe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to work ourselves out of a job, right? Any, All right, any well, how about I, I'll go and then obviously if there's questions for Joe afterwards, we can we can both take them. And I'm going to talk about the softer side. Uh, a little bit uh, kind of reinforcing what Joe was talking about, understanding the traffic safety is a public health matter and why that's so important to integrate into your plan. Uh, our goal of establishing overall community norms that reinforce safe driving and traffic safety, which helps kind of frame our work. Uh, clearly anchoring the county is caring deeply about safety, traffic safety, uh, understanding people and data, building community collaborations, and then I'll talk a little bit about our direct education uh, kind of focus where how we focus on where we think we can make a difference. Uh, traffic crashes are not just about numbers. They're, they're stories of people. For every crash, there's a decision point that it can affect the severity of injuries, whether the crash might result in more than one operator involved. Um, you see here three different stories that we use, whether it's in a classroom or with our political leaders or with our partners, to illustrate that um, so many things go into whether it's a crash or the afterwards of a crash. We've gone in some ways beyond traffic management and traffic safety into managing people, managing trauma, uh, managing mental health care, uh, both before, during and after. We have been working with Montana State University Center for Health and Safety Culture uh, to um, to really lock our work in a model of social ecology. Uh, it's this model of called positive cultural framework uh, um, states that if we can influence the values, attitudes and beliefs of an individual, then we can impact their behavior. Values and attitudes and beliefs come from culture. There are many different cultures and different groups of people. A school can have a culture, a classroom can have a culture, a football team can have its own culture, and sometimes multiple cultures within one team, and a family can have a culture. And in order to be effective, we need to look at uh, both establishing a shared culture around opportunities to improve health and safety, um, and, and look at solutions that are already embedded in that culture. It also intentionally avoids fear-based advertising and to avoid, to avoid unintended consequences. In short, people are more likely to do things because they think it fits their culture. For example, if drivers know that 93% of Oregonians wear seatbelts, they're more likely to wear a seatbelt. Or if they can be shown that 97% of students in their school wear seatbelts, even better. Um, in order to do that, we need data and we need to have that solid framework. We use this uh, map of uh, you know, a section of our county to kind of illustrate um, how connected everything is. And one of the ways I like to tell this story is uh, we had a crash where uh, a man was, uh, he is a golf pro and he's out playing golf with three of his clients. Uh, afterwards, they go get drunk, heavily drunk at the um, at the 19th hole at the clubhouse uh, luncheon. Uh, afterwards, he goes to get his car. The valet hands him his, um, his keys, um, smells alcohol all over it. The guy goes to reach his keys, drops the keys on the ground, still picks it up. Him and his three friends get in that car because now they're going to go to a bar to continue their drinking. Along the way, uh, there is a horizontal and vertical curve along the road, and his Tesla doesn't recognize the lane that's uh, the the curve that's changing. He ends up overcompensating when he grabs the wheel and goes to the other side of the road and ends up in a pond. Fortunately, he lands on a stump in the pond, and there were some damages to the vehicle and some scratches and bruises to the individuals. 
uh, but nobody was seriously injured. But I tell that story when I tell, talk with kids or adults or, or business leaders or bartenders to say, where did we go wrong? Was that an infrastructure problem? And the answer is yes, but it's also uh, a, a issue of uh, why did those friends get in the car with him? Why did the bartender continue to serve? Why did the valet hand him the keys? What are those opportunities all along the way that we could to influence? And so when we look at campaigns, we look at campaigns that adopt that culture, that understand and respect uh, where they're coming from and understand the need to really impact that culture. And I'm gonna show you a slide that we didn't do, but it really kind of, I think, influences the kind of thing that we're approaching. And hopefully they can get this to work. No, yep, here we go. It's really short. The Masquatch is a seasonal creature. He spent his summer making the most of physical distancing, but the time has come to turn his attention to the cold weather months ahead. The Masquatch knows diseases can ravage his kind, especially during the winter. So he stays home when he's sick, calls his doctor to schedule tests to learn if he has the flu or COVID, and gets a flu shot as soon as he can. Join the legends. Tacoma Pierce County Health Department reminds you to bite COVID and the flu too. Learn more at tpchd.org slash mask. I, I like it because it's just, it's it's quite simple. It's, you know, it's who we are. It's the Northwest, uh, but it has a very simple message. We're starting to integrate this into our regular public health messages um, around COVID, around um, um, caring for the whole community, uh, always showing people with masks, even if the issue isn't about masks and COVID. So this is uh, an issue about wildfires and uh, and disaster management around uh, animals, and the person has a mask because we needed to reinforce that. Um, different ages, uh, different people, and different experiences, and how important it is to kind of show that. And that message of care uh, really comes across. Um, we know that people are less likely to wear a mask for their own safety because we've had, there's research on this. And so looking at data in terms of how people are changed their behavior um, has gotten us to focus not on them wearing masks for your own safety, but wearing masks for the safety of their friends, family, et cetera. Uh, things that we're also able to do because we're a small place. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, red tape in Clackamas County. You probably don't have as much in Deschutes as say a place like Multnomah might have. Um, we wrap our vehicles. This is a delivery vehicle. It has nothing to do with the Department of Transportation and Development. But this drives around the city, around the county's uh, areas, around uh, on different places, and we can get different messages across. And this one's about selecting a designated texture. And in each of our panel, we, uh, we have Bigfoot because it's part of our little uh, brand component. Uh, the other thing we're learning is that we can't just reach big. We actually need to reach small. That micro-targeting is a really important way of getting to individuals. If I want to reach teenage boys who skateboard, I can't talk about Britney Spears or, I don't know, whoever the latest is, right? Um, I, I need to find a way to, and I also can't rely on uh, Facebook because teenage boys don't pay any attention to Facebook. And I can't, so what do I do? I look, can I put an ad in um, in video games that they're playing? Or can I put an ad in Snapchat? Or what are the mechanisms that we can do? Things that we've never even thought of before. So we hired a contractor called C plus E Consulting to help us develop a campaign to target teens. And I'm gonna just show you what we've gone through with them in order to get to the point where we are. So they shared a process that they used in Washington around some issues that this school was having on sexual violence prevention. And they knew that the Me Too movement, which was starting to really impact people's thoughts, was impacting what they wanted to tackle, but they wanted to talk to kids about how to make this work. So they had this framework. They were going to target middle school males because that was what they were concerned about, 11 to 14 year old, focusing on body, body autonomy. We, they kind of knew what they wanted to change, they thought they knew the behavior, but until they started talking to the teens themselves, um, they weren't really sure. So they conducted a, a audience research with diverse group of 56 middle schoolers, 21 girls, 35 boys via an online discussion board over multiple days to develop the concept. Um, they learned that kids didn't really understand what wanted and unwanted touching meant. So they needed to define appropriate touching and without talking to the kids, they wouldn't have known. 
Now, most of the time, a, a, a Department of Transportation doesn't think about this kind of stuff. And this, this kind of new way of thinking has really helped us. Uh, they put together a five-week media buy using YouTube, Snapchat, some Facebook, and some hyper-targeted uh, displays inside schools and areas like uh, video game, um, um, uh, places where people play games, well, uh, arcades. So here's what they came up with. Everyone's got a personal bubble. Think about how you'd feel if someone didn't respect yours. Different people have different boundaries. Always ask. It's about respect. Well, now, why was that cat there? It was because in talking to teenage boys, they wanted something silly. Everyone's got a personal bubble. Think. And um, and then it's reinforced in campaigns. Touching someone without permission is way beyond that cool. We also learned that the deliverer of the message had to be another team. Um, after doing the campaign, they found that 70% reported that they noticed the, the posters um, and that 25% reported noticing the videos. And, and that's a really good number in this type of campaign. So they worked with us to identify what kind of campaign we wanted to do. We listed the types of crashes that we saw, the kind of behavior that we thought caused those crashes. Uh, and then we evaluated them based on the impact that we thought we could have both on reducing serious crashes and injuries, the size of the population we might be targeting, as well as the willingness, or we thought the willingness of that group to change. And ultimately, we decided to focus on a campaign uh, to encourage teens to turn their do not disturbing, do not disturb function while driving on. A simple thing, we can go in, when I'm in a class, I can get the kids to actually raise their phones, do it in front of me, give rewards and, tr and, and prizes to people who do it and reinforce that cam campaign. And now we're in the process of developing um, video, TikTok video uh, components um, uh, to build that out. Other things that I do is we have a uh, art contest. We have teens submit art every other year. Uh, it reinforces uh, something that we're focusing on. I go in the classroom to do activities. In the middle, you actually see this is a boy who's driving a little car on a mat while texting on his phone. Actually, he's got um, a marijuana high goggles on, so he's trying to drive while uh, duplicating the effect of being under marijuana. But I also do texting while driving, and it really, uh, again, hits home the same messages that they're getting in driver's ed, that they might be getting from their parents, their teachers, um, by having hands-on um, activities. In the auditorium, we have a, a motivational speaker named Kevin Brooks. He's from uh, British Columbia. He crashed a car when he was in his uh, uh, late teens, and uh, he became paralyzed from the waist down, and his best friend was killed in that crash. He comes and talks to teens about resiliency. He talks about the risk of making mistakes like that, uh, but also it's a personal story about his recovery, his own mental health, his own fights against suicide. And we are now partnering with our health department to expand this beyond a traffic safety message, but to really deal with issues of trauma that crashes occur. Um, this picture um, is actually from Malala High School. And within a period of a two year period of time, these kids have lost like seven of their high school buddies due to crashes. And I knew walking in that we couldn't just say come in with this message without understanding that and realizing the potential impact uh, that this talk could have. So we need to talk to uh, school counselors and teachers so that before we come in that they're prepared to potentially um, understand what those kids might be thinking before, during and after that. Um, at events, fairs, festivals, this is our county fair. It's a great opportunity. I reach over a thousand folks at the fair. And one of the things that we also understand is that when someone makes a pledge to change their behavior, they're more likely to do it. So while the kids are doing this dress up or the kids are uh, riding these pedal cars, uh, learning about traffic safety, we get the parents to sign this drive safety pledge. And we'll work with partners. We're not the only ones. Uh, so we work with Oregon Impact and other uh, groups, uh, hospitals particularly, on car seat fitting, uh, ARP on senior driving uh, classes, and uh, my role typically is to amplify their voice and get the message out to more people uh, and to sometimes show up as a volunteer. That appeared twice in there. Bigfoot appears everywhere. Uh, this is information on how to find more uh, information about the positive cultural framework and their training. 
Uh, Joe talked already about funding and the importance of funding staff through general fund to pre prevent losing staff if grants do not come through. I'm going to give you an example. The Port city of Portland has been using uh, parking fees in order to fund their Safe House to School program. Uh, but as you probably can guess, nobody's parking downtown anymore because of COVID. And that program has been decimated, completely decimated because of that source. So be careful. Um, yes, it's great to find new creative ways, but be careful, particularly of poor staff. Uh, making sure that you've got that uh, solid funding because if money goes away from different grant programs because of political change or because of uh, economic change, uh, then you can't rely upon it. Uh, we already talked about our uh, funding sources. I'll just add that we also do get some private sources. Uh, State Farm Insurance, for example, has been funding our uh, work with Kevin Brooks, our motivational speaker, and our team art contest design program. Uh, different resources that you can tap into. Our website is www.drive to zero.org. You can find our traffic safety plan. That's a link to this. Um, uh, the Social Marketing Association of North America, which I'm a member of, is a real proponent of the behavioral change uh, uh, work that I do. Um, and uh, I have uh, provided a copy of this PowerPoint so that you don't have to write any of this down. Uh, a little bit about collaboration. Um, it's really, um, this is not about collaboration with partners, but this is about an opportunity to collaborate with us and you. So just laying some ideas as you begin thinking about that, that you don't need to start from scratch. We, we, you can steal from us. We are blessing you. Um, and that includes, you can co-brand our campaigns. If you like our campaigns, we will be willing to share it. Um, and uh, when you get to that stage where you have staff that are ready to think about this, uh, we'd be really excited to co-develop new campaigns because a lot of our audiences are going to be very similar. Um, for example, our folks that live in and around or experience uh, Mount Hood are the same type of people, maybe not as wealthy as the folks that experience Mount Bachelor, Bachelor but you know, they're a lot of the same people, right? They're the same kind of uh, approach. So uh, we have a lot to gain from talking to each other and working together. Um, Sharing sessions on best practices, uh, whether it's through Zoom or in person. And uh, lastly, benchmarking data uh, so that we have apples to apples to compare. It's not really appropriate for us to compare our crash data with Portland's crash data. It'd be great to be able to compare it to a county that's doing similar work. Uh, we wanted to thank you for having giving us this opportunity to, to speak and present to you. And we're very excited to hear what, uh, what comes out of your work. Uh, we are available. This is Traffic Safety Girls. Traffic Safety Girls on the back of all of our, um, our our wraps. So when people are driving, they see Traffic Safety starts with you with our website. Here's how to get in contact with us by email. And now again, we're open to answer any kind of questions that you might have. And I'm going to stop sharing so that I can figure that out. I think uh, what we want to do here is ask Matt Gittleson if he will uh, draw some conclusions based on what we've seen from the Clackamas County model, but also looking at other successful programs. Sure, I'll do that real quick. I think it'll set up a good discussion um, based on all that we've heard, which is just incredible stuff. Thanks again, Rob and Joe. Um, so quick slide just to talk through. Obviously, we heard a lot about Clackamas County, Lane County. We talked about last time we met. There's a lot of really great stuff going on. And I think there's a couple of themes that we can draw from this is you starting at the top one, the local champion. In this case, the county itself is, is clearly a champion driving this effort, making it a priority. Joe did a great job talking about what that looks like um, to, to um, work through what what being a champion entails and how you change hearts and minds about, about hap making that happen. Um, and then broadening that out with all the folks that, that were discussed today, Rob just ended talking about a number of those partners that, that have similar goals, particularly the public health side, funding partners, people that have the same interest in mind. And then finally, um, a theme throughout is of course, you need money to do this and finding dedicated funding. Um, the, the resiliency of the sources I think is a, is a really good input just shared about it, looking at near term and long term sources. So these are really good questions for us to continue to explore through this process. I think they're they're ongoing questions that that we need to continue to think about in Central Oregon about who is that champion or what does that champion agency look like and how does that coalition come together and how do we fund it in a regular way so it's not something 
that is an afterthought, but something that's a priority that happen now and in the future. So with that, I will now close this screen and we can see each other's faces better and open it up for questions and answers for Joe and Rob. So there were a couple chats that um, I don't know if you can see the chat just to open that up if you can't, but um, I know Janet and Ann and Andrea all commend the work that has been shared um, and as myself as well. Um, so I think being able to have a partner from the start is really a huge benefit. So thank you for being here. Um, and then I don't have any specific questions. I mean, for for the MPO, it's just how do we how do we steer our jurisdictions to create some kind of project that that will help the countywide, um, not just our boundary. So we're not. This is another jurisdictionally blind MPO work. So we're not trying to stay within our boundaries. We're just trying to get the message out to everyone in our community. Um, so being able to do that is very exciting. Um, and I know you have to leave in a little while. Do you have any in a minute? Do you have anything you want to share? Put me on the spot. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I think Anne is I, gone. I have a question. Um, you thinking about those success factors we were talking before. Um, and the coalition of people's interesting to me of of how you know, are there some obvious entities you know, cities and counties have have a mutual interest in this did you find or have you found over time that particular jurisdictions are more or less interested is there pro is there challenges you overcome with that part of it are there outside agencies that have been particularly interested or types of agencies that you found have been particularly interested what are the challenges what you see with with finding support broadly outside of the county. I'm going to start, Joe, and then I'll. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think one area, and this is actually within the county, is um, like working with our sheriff's office. It's been a little bit of an on again, off again. You know, we've gotten support, and then at times we haven't gotten support, and then now we're we're going into a time where we're getting more support and that can often be just some internal policies or even people in terms of what their own priorities within those individual organizations. And my approach has always been is that you are going to continue to see my smiling face. And um, and that is that element of diplomatic persistence where you, you don't give up, you, you continue the work. Um, and, and you just continue marching forward. And what we found is in some cases where, you know, we were like, oh, you you silly people, you go away. As at events, it's like, hmm, you you all seem to be on to something. And so may, maybe maybe this is something that we should, um, should look into more. Um, I know that ODOT has been an incredible help for us in terms of funding, in terms of moral support. Um, most of the cities that, that we talk with are, are also very supportive and they may or may not have resources. But a really good example of little ways that we can move the safety dial, and this is really simple, is that our motor carrier safety group is doing a lot of collaboration with city PDs on truck enforcement and truck safety inspections. And so, yeah, that's like, one could argue that's a little tangent, tangential to the safety side, but if you have motor carrier vehicles, like we've 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 looked at trucks before, they've had 80% of their brakes out of adjustment, and you know if they have to slam on their brakes on the freeway. They're going to take a few cars out. So I think it's always looking for those opportunities, always being there, always having an extended hand, saying we're here, we're interested in the safety. If there's anything you want to um, collaborate with us, we are here to help. So, um, and go ahead, Rob. Yeah, so the, I, I'd add a little bit is that some of the work I've been doing is intentional, some of it is accidental. Uh, the intentional work is um, utilizing existing um, 
bodies that are already engaged in safety, traffic safety. So I try to show up without an ask to traffic safety committees that regional local towns or municipalities have without an ask, just to listen to see what they're doing. And then they often go, well, what are you doing? And then getting an opportunity to present. Uh, I think, you know, it's actually a great role for M MPO to play as well as a county to play is like, is to brand, do the larger branding work and saying, okay, I've got this work. I've got Drive to Zero. Malala, if you'd like a Drive to Zero project or campaign, you can take all of our marketing, take all of our branding. You don't have to do any of that. All you got to do, in fact, if you want a draft template for a TSAP, we'll give you one of those as well. What is it? What, you know, what is we, the only thing I can't do for the most part is make your priority decisions and uh, at this point, I don't do data work for it, but that may be an area where the MPO is providing the data behind the, the planning work. Um, and then I look for other partners, people that um, either show up to activities or express interest. That could be a church. That could be a Kiwanis club. It could be a better business, I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, a chamber of commerce or a business association. Whoever is interested, I'm out there. I'm all willing to make a make a presentation. Some of them pan out, some of them don't. But I'm worth. It's worth trying, and that's been really fun, uh, because I'm out there in different communities that may lead towards them saying, "What can we do together?" Or might be leading them to make connections in a school where I didn't have a connection in a school before. And then on the internal work, like we're trying to get other county departments. Um, don't try to do everything. Start with your champions and then grow your champions piece by piece, as opposed to saying, in order to make this work, I've got to have 12 different county departments at the table all at once or it's never going to work. If you only have public health at the t table, start with public health at the table. If you only have sheriff's office, start with them. If the last person to walk in the room is the sheriff's office, it's okay because you've done a lot of work and you've built collaboration around that. So that's uh, just... Don't let perfect the drive for perfection ruin success. Do Let me something. Ask you a question: <laughs> If uh, one one of the things that is true about both Clackamas County and Deschutes County is there a combination of urban and suburban and rural, and uh, the similarity is in some ways pretty striking there. Yep. So I'm interested working with urban communities versus suburban or especially rural communities. What's what's the difference? You know, what what do you see in working with an rural uh, a rural community versus a urban area, for example? So I think you know what I see is there's definitely a little bit different flavor to the request between urban and rural. I mean, our rural populations tend to not have a great interest in government doing a whole lot, but they do like safe roads. And, um, you know, for the most part, I, I, what I see in the rural area is, uh, you know, this very strong independence. Um, and then, and then when I look in the urban area, you know, it's a, it's a different set of requests and, and often, uh, different roles that they expect the county to play in that. Um, and so what what we, you know, what we always try to do is just recognizing, you know, staying very neutral, of course, with with the people and their requests, and and um, you know, trying to satisfy the the request. But and I think the rural people, they have a, I see a certain amount of wisdom in, in in the rural people. They're they're independent, but they're also very tend to be really compassionate. And I see that just despite that they will have a sometimes a very rough exterior. Um, so yeah. that may be a little vague, but <laughs> I, I think there's some, um, there are some commonalities as well. People don't like change. Uh, things that bring change include development, uh, density, um, faster cars on streets. When they moved out here, there were only 12 cars that passed by their house every day. Now there's 12 cars that pass by every minute. Um, you hear that in the city, you hear that in a suburban area as well. But un, I think understanding that it's a different language, it's a different, um, uh, the way I talk, the way I listen, the way I engage can change with those different communities. Um, being able to be slower, et cetera. But there's also some really interesting things about that you can do in a rural community 
uh, by simply just asking. Whereas in an urban community or suburban community, you have, there, there's there's a lot more process. If that makes any sense. Um, I, mean, I would also make sure that when writing job descriptions for employees, make sure that cultural competency uh, and understanding those differences between suburban, rural, and, and more urbanized areas is part of the cultural competency of the employee. Or train them, I guess would be the op uh, alternative. Yeah. So I, you know, I grew up in I grew up in suburbia, and I think that greatly helps me. And I have uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, on on advocacy, but I've done work on both sides of the aisle, so I understand uh, the difference of speaking to someone, say, on a in a blue seat versus a red seat. Mm. And libertarians too. Everybody, right, everybody, no one wants their kids in a car crash, right? Uh, just try to take the right. politics away from it. Um, the other thing that's different is a lot less sophistication, which can be a challenge. Um, we were talking about this today in a, in a committee meeting that I had where um, there aren't any advocacy groups in the rural areas. Like there's, It's not as easy as picking up the phone and calling, say, quote, Ben Bikes. Uh, and saying, hey, what do you think about this policy that we're working on? Because there's no one that's going to answer that phone. And so for me, those partnerships are very different. That's where going, like, sometimes I have to go talk to folks in a church or I have to talk to folks in the parking lot of a school uh, because that's the gathering place, not in a formal meeting place. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think Mike's got his hand up. Hey, first I have to say hi to Joe. It's been a few years since we served on the OTC to get OTCDC together. Haven't seen you in a while. It's good to good see you again. Good to see you, Mike. Hey, um, this is great stuff. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you're doing some some really neat work. Um, I, I, I'm, one, I'm curious if you have any campaigns that are that are specifically focused on speeding. And that's one of the things I deal with all the time. And I'm a little tired of looking at speed surveys where I have most of the people being sensible and then I've got like four or five doing 45, 50 in a um, 25 mile an hour zone. You know, this is more of an urban problem, uh, but it's it's the kind of thing I, I deal with a lot and I'm sure you you hear it too. So we, we have a, we have like a yard sign campaign where we, we do give out yard signs to people that uh, our traffic safety commission actually help make up the signs. Obviously, it's not a strong deterrent. We also do have a, a radar reader sign program where we have signs that we will put around temporarily on post mounted uh, for about a month or so. And we, we usually end up with a 12 to 18 month wait list for those. We have about 10 signs that we rotate around. So that's another program that, that we have. Um, and and Rob, I don't I don't think we've done specific anything specifically yet around speeding. Speeding is a, a tough one to to get at. Well, um, on the ahead, behavioral Rob. change side, we're working a, a lot against big money uh, advertisement. I mean, every car advertisement is about the joy of going fast. Uh, I would say that. In my mind, 80% of working on speeding is about infrastructure change. And one of the challenges we have in rural communities and suburban communities is the political will to make those changes. Um, we can't just put up a sign that says it's now 35 miles an hour and expect that people are gonna slow down if roads are designed on wider basis. And that's one of the things we learned in COVID is as we had less traffic, people were going really fast because now they could. Um, mm -hmm. It's also a challenge to work on inf um, as an enforcement issue because one, our sheriff is a separately elected body and I don't have any, I have to influence their work and they just don't have much resources. They have one to three people at any given time working on traffic for 1400 miles a road. So, um, and within the community, the, the it's a growing understanding that traffic is really not about slowing traffic or Tra stopping people doing bad things in traffic. It's about finding opportunities to stop other criminal activities from occurring in the future. 
and, uh, and and so that's a challenge for us is that we don't necessarily want to be a part of that. Um, so uh, we don't counties do not have the ability to do uh, automated enforcement at this time. Um, that's something that we would love to find opportunities in the future to potentially convince the uh, AOC to potentially take on as a priority. Um, what I do do is when I do present in schools, I take over health one and health two classes for schools. So I teach at almost every high school uh, at least once uh, a semester. And we talk about the science of speeding. We talk about uh, you know kinetic uh, energy. Uh, whether it makes any difference, I have no idea. Well, it's, it, it's good to hear we're doing similar things as far as the neighborhood signs and, and the driver feedback signs. Um, and I, I've, I've, I like the ones, you know, trying to get the message of, you know, drive like it's your neighborhood. Because most of the people that are speeding, you know, they might be going, they, they're, they're worried about speeding in their neighborhood, but down the road they're doing 35, 40, um, or, or even 33, you know, in a 25, you know, that, that, that gets people wound up. Our but yeah, next, it's a tough our, one. Our next then, campaign that we launch in two weeks, we don't launch the campaign, we launch the starting conceiving point of the campaign in two weeks, is to see whether we can link our COVID safety message with speeding and reckless driving. Um, and and see if we can learn some of the lessons that were learned off of these the COVID messaging, what does work, what doesn't work, apply it to transportation and vice versa. So ask me again in six months and maybe I'll have a campaign for you. Okay, and, I, and I have seen the signs of drive like your kids live here. And then in the rural area, I've actually seen a couple of signs of drive like your cows live here, which I thought was pretty cool. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Any any more questions for these gentlemen? Just, I mean, I don't, this is probably a, it's a loaded question, sort of. I know that just given the politics of your county commission, you know, over the last 20 years, how challenging has it been to maintain, to be able to continue getting, I mean, number one, to start getting general fund money and then to continue keep, keep you know, keeping it flowing into your program? Is that you know, it's been really interesting. So, you know, having done this for almost 30 years, we've we've been all over the map with regards to political leanings of the commission. Every commission we've had have have strongly supported safety. And um, and so I've always been pleased with that. I think we have always strived to to be very politically neutral with our safety messaging. And there are times, you know, we're a little bit more careful talking about some aspects and other aspects de depending on kind of what's happening politically. But all of the boards have been supportive of, of both the funding, supportive of the, the general funding that we use for that and, and supportive of the, the programs and the outreach. So that's actually been pleasantly, um, pleasantly consistent. Um, we have a, you know, and it's not just the boards. It's like our traffic safety commission consists of some people who are pretty uh, hard line conservative uh, that are, um, and again, keeping out of politics, keeping data at the forefront, um, and um, being willing to try some new innovative ideas, I think has been very helpful. Uh, finally, storytelling. Uh, and once you once one in, in finding the right person to tell the story, whether that's a victim, uh, a parent of a kid, or high school teacher, um, you start to learn other stories. So, for example, one of our biggest champions on our board is a Republican man who lost, I think it's like three or four members of his house, uh, very close household, was, and both his parents and a brother. I think that's right, and. He doesn't talk about it often, but when he talks about it, it sure is powerful. And this man is never going to vote no on anything that we do. And uh, I'm not sure that was the case 10 years ago, but so understand that people can um, sometimes come into politics raring to go, excited, and you know, uh, but over time can really come around and, and understand more nuanced uh, uh, projects and campaigns. That's great. Thank you.
Any any other questions? I wanted to say thank you to both of you for the effort that you put into developing the presentation and congratulations on the program. And I think we we would like the to uh, take you up on the offer to uh, perhaps partner on something in the future and have further discussions about what that might look like. Again, the Shoots County is just getting started. You're you're already there, so. And if it helps to have any of our peers, like our, our friends of public health, talk to your public health, let us know. That's a great offer as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wanted to just take a moment to talk about what comes next. Uh, we would like to have another meeting with this group, maybe in about a month. And at that time, talk about the shape of a public education campaign and what a calendar might look like if we're going to do public education over a year, what that would look like. And uh, so we, for the next meeting, we will send you some information ahead of time to take a look at, but be looking for meeting announcement or at least possible dates being floated to you here uh, shortly. So, and again, probably around the middle of June. So just about a month from now would be the, the right interval. Anything else that anybody would like to offer here uh, in closing remarks? So briefly, um, seeing Joe and, and Rob's presentation, you could allow that to be, to feel overwhelming. But the thing you have to remember is that Joe and I started talking over coffee at a at a Starbucks and said, well, how can we go about making this happen? And that led to a small grant and a small amount of project work that then grew into multiple funding streams, multiple projects and multiple successes. So the idea here with your group and your work is to start small, find your success for the Bend and Deschutes County area and then move forward with an eye to completing the, the tasks on your um, on your strategic plan. The, the plan provides the, the guide path or the framework of your work. And now you can go forward and look for success opportunities. One of the things that uh, was built into Rob's and Joe's presentation was the importance of their partnership with ODOT. You know, ODOT has been a partner in this thing from the beginning. I know uh, Walt and his team are directly involved in what we're doing as well, but that that will, that, that also I think is a success factor. When you're looking at champions on Matt's list, ODOT clearly has been a champion in Clackamas County's program. Anything else that, well, I hope we see you all next time as well. And meanwhile, enjoy whatever this weather, however long it lasts. <laughs>